Come on. Hello everyone and welcome to uh, MAM 101. Hello everyone and welcome to MAM 101. Um, my name is Mark Hodenot and I'm the host of this, the first session of MAM 101 and we're looking forward to presenting to you today um, uh, an opportunity for you to ask the sorts of questions that you've always pondered but never quite had the right answer to. Um, and you will know, uh, or perhaps you don't know, but there's been such a huge swell of new supporters coming to the Facebook pages of uh, the MAM groups and we thought it was a great opportunity to present um, information to those new supporters and the, the ones that have been around a bit longer and hopefully create an educational environment within which uh, people can feel confident that they have, um, if you like, the most up-to-date information. Information can take many forms. It can be case specific information. It might be issues about legal matters. It could be issues about uh, the Avery family and, and Stephen and Brenda and how they're going. Um, pretty much any question that you might want to ask is here uh, and available for us to answer. We do, we do operate on the basis that if we don't know the answer, we'll tell you, but we'll go off and research and come back with you to give you the right answer in the following episode. I did want to say before I introduce our guests a few things. Firstly, uh, one of the abiding principles that we always um, have hold dearly is the presumption of innocence. So we will not be entertaining any questions that specifically uh, point uh, to someone's guilt. Um, we're certainly happy to deal with issues of investigation and whether investigations were thorough or not. But if you were to ask a direct question, do we believe such and such uh, is guilty of the crime? Uh, we won't answer that directly because we don't want to um, undermine the presumption of innocence, which was a very big thing that both Stephen and Brendan didn't get in their trials and one of the reasons why they're still incarcerated to this day. But with that small caveat, we're very confident that we'll be able to answer most of your questions and um, 
hopefully we'll do so in a clear and concise way. We're going to try to keep the session uh, fairly tight to around 45 minutes and um, I'm very lucky to have a, a great panel of guests with me today. Some of which hopefully are still, are still to come along but I'm going to introduce each one of them first. Um, I'll bring them on to, they're, at, they're currently out in the green room having coffee and donuts um, and so I'm going to bring them on board one by one and um, you can say hello and they'll introduce themselves. So uh, ladies first, um, I'm just going to, Diane, I think your mic's muted. There we go. Uh, this is Diane Little Misty uh, all the way from the UK. So Hello. welcome, Diane. Thank, Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you for having me. Good to be well, here. Our, yeah, our pleasure. Diane, uh, could I just ask you to, for the benefit of all our guests or um, people on the, the broadcast today, if you could just give us a little bit of background about yourself and uh, how you became involved in the whole Making a Murder uh, story. Yeah, sure. Um, so I've been following it for just over two years now. Um, I started watching, I'd watched Making a Murderer 1, probably like the start of 2018. And then um, when I watched Making a Murderer 2, um, I saw Kathleen Zauner and she made me really pay attention to what was going on. And I started then chatting to people on Twitter and got to know a lot of the people who are here in the chat um, and really digging in a little bit deeper to find out more information and my main interest is about keeping the story alive and keeping positivity um, so I do a lot of things on Twitter that's and that's basically it in a nutshell <laughs> yeah. yeah well uh, you're a very strong advocate and I know you're particularly personally interested in the law and, and at an appropriate time, are hoping to pursue uh, an educational interest uh, more, more formally in that. So, mm -hmm. welcome aboard and thank you for participating today. Yeah, thank you for having me. Um, yeah, you're very welcome. Next, I'll bring online is uh, uh, Wisconsin's and Milwaukee's uh, greatest orange beanie collector, Mr. Millbilly Jeeps. Um, Welcome, Bill Billy. Uh, thank you for coming coming on today. And um, as with Diane, perhaps you could uh, give us a little background on your introduction to MAM. Well, uh, I live in Wisconsin, so when the Stephen Airy saga began back in 2005, it was all over the news, all over the papers. Couldn't get away with it. Talking to people during that time, they were like, oh, he's being framed, he's being framed. Then the Brendan Dassey issue happened, and then pretty much everybody was like, oh, he must have done this now. Making a Murder comes out. I watched the first season, binge watched it like pretty much everybody else did. Uh, started looking into things here and there, got into some Facebook groups. Then Making Murder 2 came out, and that's when I really dove in. And it's been a non-stop, just going over documents, audio, all kinds of stuff. It's trying to, nothing makes sense in this case. Yeah. Can I just quickly ask you, Millbilly, prior to this, Matt, had you mm -hmm. ever got so deeply involved in any sort of justice matter or anything that, uh, nope. that kind of... Uh, so it it says a lot about the injustice of this that you've kind of transformed yourself into this investigator uh, of great note. I should hasten to add, and um, so thank you. It's a, yeah. So thank you very much for joining us. And I'm going to now introduce um, one of your partners in crime. In fact, uh, this is uh, Big Jeff. Uh, hello, Jeff. How are you going? Hey, Mark, thank you very much for having me uh, on. Uh, you're very welcome, all the way from Massachusetts. Um, yes, sir. Uh, <laughs> and uh, I'm sure you're, you're um, also very familiar with how to uh, fix a drug scandal uh, Netflix <laughs> documentary. So, <laughs> yes, I am. Is, uh, <laughs> that's, that's quite the story for anyone who is looking for a Netflix thing to watch. Uh, that's quite frightening, actually, What how that can... Have such a big impact but well, i won't go into that but i would like you if you would jeff to kind of just like the others give us a bit of background into your connection to uh, uh making a murder and how you've become involved 
Well, I'd be happy to do that, Mark. Thank you very much. Uh, like Diane, uh, I uh, got into the MAM around the uh, time frame of MAM 2 being released. I think I was a week late, um, but uh, I had to binge watch MAM 1 and MAM, and MAM 2 probably within the course of uh, you know one uh, Christmas holiday. He came out around oh, wow. Thanksgiving, <laughs> yeah. uh, and and uh, you know one thing that one thing that struck me about the case was obviously the gross misjustice of it. Uh, but when Kathleen Zellner was talking about the possibility that you know one one of the great avenues was the uh, to his pr proving his innocence was potentially a cell phone. Uh, that's that happens to be the line of work I'm in as a cellular area, so I just couldn't help but uh, w w want to dive in. But since then, I've sort of expanded my interest. And one of the things I've done a lot of research on is the 1985 case. Uh, and I think that bears an important, uh, you know, bears an important part of actually what happened to Stephen uh, in, his, in his trial and in his, uh, you know, sec second framing uh, and, and his second incarceration. Uh, and the reason why I stay involved is very simply because, you know, just all it takes is for one good man to look away at an injustice. Uh, and that is going to be the end of justice for everybody. But that's why I stay involved. Uh, well, that's wonderful, Jeff. I, to be honest, I hadn't realised your particular uh, interest in uh, cellular phone matters. Um, so um, that's fascinating. But you're quite right. I, the the Stephen Avery, Brendan Dassey matters really are just the tip of the iceberg in terms of issues that are going on in the justice system in the United States. And uh, if, if that's one thing that's brought a huge surprise to me is to find out how many others like this that actually exist around the country. So thank you very much for joining us. And I'll bring in our next guest all the way from Melbourne, Australia. There she is, Tracy Keogh. Hi, Tracy. Hi, can you hear me? I We can. Thank you for joining us. Okay, I've, I've just yeah. been... I've been fighting with my computer for the past half an hour. <laughs> Don't worry, uh, we've all had that issue, right, Jeff? So, <laughs> so yeah, we had a little we had a little trouble getting Jeff's audio going. So, Tracy, welcome to the, this our first broadcast of MAM one hundred and one, and thank you very much for uh, participating. We've just asking each of our guests to just introduce just briefly the, how they became involved in MAM and. Uh, uh, if you could do that, that'd be wonderful. Um, I guess, like many people, uh, moved to action by Brendan Bassey, um, watching the injustice that um, was inflicted upon a 16-year-old vulnerable kid. So uh, watching it, I couldn't walk past it. It's a story you shouldn't walk past. Um, and from there, it just it turned me into a ferocious advocate. Um, you know, I've always been socially justice-minded, but this was something else on a different scale. So, yeah, uh, I, I am I am solely here for Brad Bass. Yes, uh, and uh, boy, you've dug dive deep into a whole range of things, both including your own podcast. Um, and uh, thank you so much for all that you do, Tracy. It's uh, just a wonderful contribution to the whole effort that everyone puts together for MAM. In fact, one of the things I like about, I like immensely about our group is the diversity of people, both in terms of what they what they do, what how they think, where they're from. I think that diversification adds so much powerful to the arguments that we try to put forward. So thank you all again. I am expecting one other person to come on board, hopefully, but uh, I'll introduce that person once they arrive. If, so everyone, we're, we're now uh, over to you to ask questions. And I, we, I, I'm assuming that all our guests here can see the chat going on on the side. I've yep. been uh, having a, a little bit of a look down as we go along while everyone's been introducing themselves. So um, I'm, I'm just asking you now if you have some questions to put them to us, um, and we're more than happy to answer them. Um, and perhaps to, to to kick it along uh, as a as a starting point I might actually just ask um, um, Millbilly if I could a question about uh, you've been you've been doing a lot of things lately in regard to documentation and uh, particularly also of uh, missing missing documentation when you are when there are freedom of information requests being made particularly in relation to phone calls, for example. 
there are very large gaps in what's been provided. Tell us a little bit about that. Well, it depends on which which part you're. Well, there's missing phone calls between Stephen and Jody. They won't release. I've been now listening to the Queso dispatch and going through Queso and seeing if what they say matches up to what happens in the audio. And it's yeah. not. It's not. What a surprise! Yeah. So. In, in your freedom of information request where you're looking for records of phone calls uh, between Jody and Stephen. Jody was Stephen's girlfriend at the time. She was incarcerated yeah. for well, some they released alcohol crimes. 1, 000, over a thousand phone calls have been released, but four. And the phone yeah. calls between the 27th and the 8th of November. Yeah, so for the benefit of our um, newer members, uh, Obviously, um, Theresa's disappearance was on the 31st of October. So the nature of the calls surrounding that date become very important because they could go to, if you like, the, the thought patterns of Stephen and others uh, around that time. And so getting copies of those phone calls, which are, are available, um, but filtering them and only giving selected ones, has got to put, put the question out there as to what are they... What do they need to hide something for? Um, that's, well, what, what could that's... possibly be uh, what could possibly be inculpatory about a phone call that was made before October thirty first? Exactly, <laughs> exactly. Yeah. They like to hide things in this case, though, don't they? Everything seems to go missing, like the yes. voicemails. <laughs> oh, so, and uh, another thing I found out: there's three dispatch lines that Manitowoc had. One of them they put out in the paper, the 683-4200. We don't have any audio at all for that. So, I mean, it just goes back to this basic issue. Why do you need to withhold stuff? That's I mean, they, really they, put, they put this number in the newspaper, so the mass has seen it. Yeah. So, yeah. especially in that area, not to mention it was on the news. Yes. Mm. So... Um, so I'll start with some questions from our, our audience. Uh, we have a question here from uh, Jennifer Manning. Jennifer, thank you very much for the question. She, Jennifer asks, how is it that KZ can't see what has been sealed? Right, so this is a legal question. I'm not sure uh, who might feel competent to answer this question. Um, does anyone Travis, want to put their hand up? Travis, yeah, tra tra Travis answered it, so. <laughs> Oh, did he? He said, he said like, yeah, go ahead, go ahead, Diane. Oh, <laughs> oh yeah, no, there we go. Yeah. Yeah. Beat us too. <laughs> Good on you, Trav. So, <laughs> uh, just so everyone knows, Travis, who's in the chat there, he's a lawyer. So, uh, um, uh, and uh, uh, he'll probably be one of our panelists in future episodes. So, uh, Jennifer, I hope that answers your question. Uh, Travis, Travis says, KZ can see everything that has been sealed, and she has requested certain exhibits be sealed. But it does raise the question for me, an interesting kind of allied question as to why is it the state gets the discretion over which evidence can be further examined? I, you know, they're happy to release certain things and not happy to release others. I mean, why? Uh, does anyone have any thoughts about that? They're hiding, hiding something. They, they have a narrative they're trying to create, uh, and uh, they, they, you know, the the court of public opinion is almost as important when you're trying to, you know, f sort of uh, set set a jury up, if you will. Just ask Ken Kratz about his early March press conference uh, and and, wh and why he did that, right? He poisoned the jury pool. He sets the minds of potential jurors, uh, so that they're trying to they're trying to frame a narrative. Yeah, I just yeah. what I don't understand is the equity issue. I mean, evidence is evidence, um, so provided it, it's handed over with in with pro appropriate protocols and well, care why why should why should it be a selective matter as to which items you give well, you I think that's my evidence Brendan Dassey, there is none yeah I, I, I think that's the thing now with them um, you know protocols and everything they only they're only effective if somebody is like managing them like, yes. if they're abused and like the person who's supposed to be overseeing them is allowing it to happen and just turning a blind eye then that it's pointless having those policies and procedures in place it's yes. just well, like tick box exercises it's well, the yeah. lack of audio in Manitowoc's side is 
telling. Indeed. Tracy, did you have something you wanted to say about that issue of evidence? Actually, I was going to talk about Kratz. <laughs> <laughs> he's, he's, yes. you, you mentioned Kratz. I'm like, oh, I'm going there. I'm going there. <laughs> no, I just, just a general sort of observation, I think, with Kratz and in particular to the, the press conference is that, you know, Kratz before this particular trial was, you know, dealing with traffic stops. Um, and, you know, uh, misdemeanors and things like that. So this was a huge opportunity for Kratz, you know, and I think that uh, we look at the press conference and what he did, you know, was was very anti-ethical and, and all those types of, um, you know, names that we could throw at it. But uh, I think there's also a sense of the guy being just really, really fucking over-enthusiastic about it, you know. Um, mm. But anyway, I do digress. Please, please <laughs> no worries. <laughs> um, I'm, go I'm going to go to another question from one of our guests. Uh, Mark Morris has asked, um, it's in the same vein as the previous one, uh, why is the flyover edited and what do we think of that fact? Mm. Who'd like to start there? Diane. Yeah, um, well, it's for the same reason that any of it goes missing or like that they release the bits of information that they want people to see like if the people who are investigating they're not going to see you know yeah. the real story right? so yeah. well well just, if uh I Uh, I, I, Diane cut out. I apologize. I, I, I thought. No, you're I was, right. uh, okay. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> sorry. Uh, yeah. So, so um, clearly they were up in that aircraft uh, for over four hours uh, on, on the on the day of the first uh, flyover. On the that would be on the fourth, right? Yes. Um, and uh, you know they, they they were taking video. They took four hours worth of video. If you look at the beginning of that video, you can hear Fassbender talking about, "Oh, well, this is the button I have to press to delete everything." Uh, and, and they, they only have approximately three minutes worth of video uh, that uh, oh, yeah. that they had, and they probably deleted it. Why did they delete it? Because I'll tell you why. Because if you look at the next day, they fly in you know, 15, 20 places where they can very easily see the RAV4. If the RAV isn't there, they have a problem, right? They have a big problem if the RAV4 is not there on the, on the fourth video. Uh, and that's why I suspect that they edited it, because it wasn't yeah. there. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's fairly clear from other evidence that it was brought in on either the the Friday afternoon, which is the fourth, or the early Friday evening. But keeping in mind, it's it's getting into winter, and so it's it, dark it, early. So that car could have very well been brought in there Saturday morning. Yeah, yeah. Because um, Earl Avery let two people on the property, let them drive in the exact area that the Rav was found. And he does not remember them leaving. Yeah. And then Pam shows up an hour later and finds a car. Yeah. Although, what, was it the Friday afternoon, Mill Billy, that Mr. Siebert, Wilbur Siebert, um, identified cars going in and only one coming out? Yep, down Friday the back. evening. Yeah, yeah Friday yep. evening. So, but we don't, the have the, we don't have the audio of that. So, yeah. We have the audio of his daughter calling in on the ninth saying that his he's seen cars driving around in the pit yes and yeah. then for some reason the officer that is called about this is at the avery road checkpoint and he's supposed to be working until 8 a.m and he's taken off of that checkpoint shortly after that phone call yeah yeah right that's interesting uh, I have a question from Sean. Uh, I think it, no, is that the right way to pronounce it? No, Sian, S-I-A-N-E. Oh. How do I pronounce that? Um, Sean. Sean, E. Yeah. Uh, Sean wants to ask Mill Billy, which phone, calls, which phone call sticks in your head the most as being most important to the case? The one at 9.33 p.m. on 11.3. Explain that, Mill Billy. Well, that's right after, well, he... Jody calls his mother's house just after 5.30, talks to her for about 15 minutes. He gets off the phone with her. Colburn comes. He goes over by Barb's, reopens his cut. Then him and Chuck go to leave, see lights. They go to Menards. 
They go to the sheriff's office, drop off fifty dollars on Jody's books, and he's home in time at nine thirty three to get that phone call. And he's mm-hmm. gonna talk about everything that just happened between the last time he talked to her. Why won't they let us hear that? Yes. Yes, very true. Very, very true. Um because Matt's yeah. talk and Kelly Mitch timeline for the third, it, it don't make no sense. No. Like no, Dietering radios in saying he's going to the Mad Talk Sheriff's Office and the Uyghur calls in looking for him, trying to call him on the radio. Calls they call Pagel and Pagel informs Uyghur that Dietering's standing next right right next to him. But he was supposed to be en route to the sheriff's office. So why is he telling the dispatcher something that's not happening? Yes, just the whole time frame things don't it, it just doesn't add up and I don't know. There's a few pieces of information that I need to confirm, deny what I think happened, and they're not releasing it. Yes, I go ahead, Jeff. Yes. Why 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 do you suppose Deb Strauss on the search herself on the fourth? On the fourth, oh yeah, uh, she she calls up. This is Deb Strauss. Stephen Avery, the name keeps on coming up. I'm no fan of Stephen Avery. I want to offer all the investigative services of my organization. On the fourth, the RAV has, RAV four hasn't even been found yet. Nope, yet a no. yet a this DCI hey. agent is calling, offering her services against Stephen Avery. To add to that, immediately after RAV four is found, the Attorney General office is calling, trying to get talk to contact with Mark Rohr. Why is that? Yes. Okay, so um, there a question from Donna, uh, which is again a legal type question. Um, Donna asks, can Kathleen not challenge potential cross contamination of the scene? That is, members of the public being allowed to freely walk around a crime scene. Um, I've really, I, I really haven't seen this Where, issue raised by Kathleen. Where's the crime scene? It's not Stephen's trailer. It's not Stephen's garage. No, yeah. but they're saying, they're saying it's the <laughs> so like, I know, but to, yeah. To be honest, I think like that's the least of um the the least of her problems and what she's got to raise. Like, yeah, they're saying that's the crime scene and people are just walking in and out and everything, but I think her challenging that is like bottom of the list in my opinion. It is important but it's like the pieces of evidence that they've presented at the trial that are the most important things to tackle because that's what convicted Stephen. Yes, correct. And she's she's a she's a she's a bulldog about taking it to, apart piece by piece. So um, mm. every every item. Um, I think that sort of question does show us though is that from people who you know we we aren't in the legal community that we're coming into this and we're looking at at how this played out and and you know it's like how how can that possibly happen you know how can that potential or so-called crime scene be overrun with people i think that's a really valid question you know mm-hmm. um i just think you know it's how people are looking at this case and what they're seeing um and it's almost outrageous like why were there so many people on that um, on the Avery salvage chart. So I think it's a really valid question. It's also valid because a couple of those people were citizens, more, more than a couple, but citizens that were should have rightly been treated with no no accusation here, should have right, rightly been treated as suspects given their relationship to Teresa. So how do they suddenly, one, not get treated as suspects um, uh, or persons of interest at the very least, and at the same time still be allowed to crawl over the alleged crime scene. Well, it's just you, funny you know. to say that. The morning of the 7th, you hear in the audio, Uyghur saying that they just found out that Scott and Teresa had a sexual relationship. So what do they do? They call Scott and Ryan and say, hey, come right on the property. Come right yeah. into the crime scene. Yes. They're there for about an hour. <laughs> Deb Strauss shows up right before they show up. They leave, she leaves. They then return about 12 hours later, about 4, 4.30 in the afternoon, and there for about an hour. Deb shows up, they show up, they leave, she leaves. And, yeah. and it's, it brings into question again, um, 
Mike Halbach, I don't know the name and names, but I am, uh, Mike Halbach and Ryan Hillegas, you know, openly lying on the, uh, the TV interview that they oh, haven't had. No, no, My, you got to look at, My, you got to look at Mike's reaction. Oh, when, I, yeah. That was, he, he doesn't know that Ryan and Scott were on the property. Mike had no clue about that. You could tell just by his reaction. Yeah. Yeah. I think the hall box were hoodwinked. I, yeah. I, 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 would, I would agree with that. Mm-hmm. Uh, and got got caught into a net that they couldn't find a way out of. Well, you look so, at um, just the way what Mike says in his little press conferences. Yeah. yeah. Suspect. The grieving, yeah. Process, the grieving process is going to last a day or a week. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, they would have been under. I mean, we always knew we'd see Teresa again. Yeah, yeah. Just every so word. Now it's going to be in heaven. I mean, go ahead, yeah. Trace. I'm just saying that every word that they said, like we can pick this apart, and we do every word that they say that we we psychoanalyze. We we you know our own conscious bias goes into this. How how are they addressing? How are they answering? You know, what's the tone of their voice? How are they looking? Um, but you know, we we don't know how people grieve. We don't know how. Thankfully, we don't know how people grieve in that situation. I hope everybody here doesn't. Um, but you know, it, it is. Um, I think you know, just going back to to the uh, the log going on to the salvage yard. You know that that interview with Mike and, and Ryan is extremely questionable. Extremely questionable. But, yeah. Mm-hmm. I agree with that very much, Tracy, but one thing I'd like to add is there was a case in England, and I wish I could remember the name of the case, uh, where investigators, uh, you know, st- chose to take a second look at the at the eventual, uh, you know, guilty party, because that guilty party spoke about a missing person in the past tense. With, with the children. Oh, and children. The children. Yeah. It was yeah. Yeah. So, mm-hmm. Friday, I think. Yes. Yeah. So, uh, so I'm not... In Huntley, sorry. Huntley. Yeah, I'm not questioning the grieving process, but they do speak about Teresa in the past tense. So yes. that, that's that, I, I'd ask for that courtesy to be. And that's uh, that's uh, as early as the, that's as early as the, that's the day after she's reported missing. That's right. What yeah. talking yeah. about? I get that. It's it's disconcerting. You know? It's kind of like it's at odds with what you think that somebody would be saying or should be saying. Mm. But I think there's a benefit of doubt here. I mean, we can look at. Um, the Angie Dodd case, uh, Dodge case, for example, and, and uh, Carol Dodge for 13 years believed that Chris Tapp was guilty. Um, you know, her, she was like destroyed over it. And then she starts looking into the case herself, comes around, Chris isn't guilty, you know, he's been exonerated and, and what have, have you. And it was through the advocacy of uh, the victim's mother that led the, the charge for, for Chris Tapp, you know. Um, but it, it's, I, I try to think about the whole box and the fact that they've lost their daughter. Um, how can I judge how they react? Because if I judge how they react, then, you know, we can look at Linda Chamberlain, we can look at loads of cases where people are, the Madeleine McCann case. Where well, well just like when Mike Hallbox says, oh, anybody can just pop that tape in and watch the Brendan Dassey confession and just see he's guilty. They, have you watched it, Mike? No. No. Yeah. Mm. yeah, I, I just, I, I can't, I can't explain their behaviour. Um, mm. It's not how I would behave, and mm. I see all the discrepancies in in how you know, particularly Mike Halbach, uh reacted to what was going on. But at the same time, or, or when Ryan Hill, when Ryan Hill gets his testifying in trial, Mike that, is yeah, that's, nervous that's as hell. Yeah. Mike is yeah. sitting there nervous as hell. Yeah. yeah. Oh, he's I don't. Sitting just, the, he's sitting don't on the edge of his seat, like can biting just, his nails. Can I just say about like talking in the past tense, though? Because I was like rereading over some of the notes that I took at the very beginning when I first started reading through things, and one of the things that I noted was that um, when Tom Pierce was being interviewed, um, he also spoke in the past tense about Teresa. So, Tom Pierce being a, a work colleague of Teresa's, Diane. Yeah. Yes. Yep. Just so, for the benefit of those who may not remember who Tom is. Yep. Yeah. yeah. He, call, yep. he called yep. Kelly Met offering information first. Yep. He then called again on Friday and they wouldn't talk to him. Mm. And then they re interviewed him. 
He's, and, he's and, the one who called Karen Halbach and said Teresa hasn't been show hasn't showed up to work. Didn't show up to yeah. the business right. meeting. Yeah. Hasn't seen her since the office on Sunday. Yeah. Wow. We, 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 we can, oh, we can that I mean, the mother. How far away did Teresa live from her mom? And her hundred mom, yards. Her, days, yards. And her daughter's not around. Mm. That's hard. That's hard to imagine how that happens. She literally mm. lived a hundred yards next door. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, so. It's hard to, given the nature of Teresa, by all accounts, as a lovely, loving girl who loved a, a family, etc. You, you would have thought yeah, that would be out of character not to be in contact with them for three if days. Karen Holbach was just to look at her daughter's house. She wouldn't see her car. Yeah. No, because the car's ducked around the other side of the house. But right. I'm mm -hmm. sure Karen, Karen uh, sorry, Teresa strikes me as the sort of daughter that would be in touch with her family on and and sisters. On a yeah. regular basis, even if it was only through social. Well, that's social the thing. Media, we so. really yeah. don't know anything about Teresa, really. Yeah. They try to uh, paint her as some squeaky clean church yeah. girl. But even if she wasn't a squeaky clean church girl, like she still lived with somebody who's who who apparently had a relationship, yeah. whether it was uh, just a friendship or a relationship, and um, it was his birthday, so like, on the. Is it the second? It was his yes. birthday. Yeah, and you know, apparently she wasn't reported missing until the third. Well, oh. it was my birthday. Ah. My friend who I lived with wasn't around. I'd be like, "Wow, like, what's going on?" Yeah, I mean, and usually people are going to be suddenly away. They'll let you know, "Hey, I'm going to be away for a couple of days." Just and so you know, that's yeah. no, that hasn't happened. Mm. Yeah. I'd like to, if I could, go back to a couple of questions in the chat. Uh, one comes from Travis, and Jeff, it kind of relates to your skill set. Travis is asking about uh, the phone towers and the geolocation testing of cell data, etc. Um, could you just give us an overall commentary about your knowledge of, you know, KZ's done a lot of work in testing where the pings were coming off the various towers. Have you got any thoughts about that from your, from your background? Oh, I, yeah, I have a lot of thoughts uh, about that. Um, and uh, tra Travis is, is essentially right that uh, KZ, uh, she had brought that up even in MAM2 as one of the potential venues uh, because she did ping that White Law Tower, uh, was the last tower that she pinged, which, is, which there are a lot of other seemingly more favorable towers that if she was actually where they said she was, that she would have pinged otherwise. No, um, that, I, that tower I, I, is now gone. I have a question. What, what do you make of her cell phone records? <laughs> uh, well, there's, there's a lot. There's a lot to make of those. Um, but let, let, quickly, let me just finish on that because he asked a very specific question. Uh, back in 2005, there was no E911 requirement, uh, so that, so there was not uh, geolocation data tagged with with those cell phone pings. Nor is there today, unless you dial 911. Uh, so all we have is is that she was under the footprint of, of you know one particular sector of that of that tower, um, and uh, you know it's just to me very strange that it that it reached that far. Uh, with regard to her cell phone records, uh, I, I just I just can't believe that nobody was smart enough to ask for the texts. Uh, you know, right right now uh, that that would be the first thing that anybody would would ask for in in a, in a case like this. Uh, and supposedly her phone went off at 3:45. That was the last CFNA that she was never heard from again. That would have mean there would have been a pile. Of, so so but by 2005, uh, there was a piece of network equipment called the SMS Service Center, which is where the text messages are stored and relayed. There would have been at least at the time metadata about the text that she got that day, saying how many she got. Um, what time? What time they were forwarded to her phone and whatnot? Uh, because you know, she had a she had a plan. You can look you can look at her original uh, service contract that she paid only for a certain amount of text. So they have to count those texts, and that's considered evidentiary by the phone company that they have to keep track if she should challenge the fact that yeah you know, I didn't get I didn't get a hundred texts. I don't owe you fifty dollars for those hundred texts. Uh, um, you know they have to keep that as sort of billing evidence so that they can say that. So so that information was around. Uh, it's it's um, you know it's very perishable because they don't need to save it forever. But it's just hard for me to believe that nobody even thought to thought to ask for it. Well, um, uh, the thing about it, they they first when they first subpoenaed her cell phone information, they asked just for her pings, and then yeah. they asked for everything else, and they're like, "Oh, you got a subpoena for that too." 
Yep. And that's when they got that the next day. They got her ping stuff that night on the uh, third. Yeah. And, and the, interestingly, at the beginning, we were talking about, um, uh, you know, how, how they bury certain documents. The, al- along with that ping data, they sent a document that indicated where the towers were, what the sector numbers of the towers were. So it could actually track, you know, what, what you know, about where she was under the footprint of a particular tower. Um, it, it turns out that I got that I got that documentation from a researcher named um, Seeking Truth for Good. But that document didn't have any queso do- document number. Uh, now, now at the time, the cell phone company would have considered that proprietary data, but why doesn't it have a document number, right? So, so they, if they if they get something, they should at least be able to say they have it, but they can't release it because it's proprietary. But why no document number at all? What other documents did they get from the phone company that they decided were weren't worthy of a document number and and and, and buried? And that's just indicative of the entire of the entire uh, you know case where they information they don't want you to have they they bury it very deeply. Mm. Yes, indeed. Um, actually, there are some related questions to this issue that which I might sort of try to bundle together as a bunch of questions. One from Paul Ward and um, uh, regarding um, t- Cuss Road, and uh, also one from I just trying to think who it was from now talking about the proximity of the towers to Cuss Road. Um, so the, so the, bundle, the bundled questions is, does, from Kelly Droster, does, does, uh, does the Cuss Road location make sense in terms of the tower? Uh, the tower is quite a long way from Cuss Road, uh, by the way, certainly compared to other towers. Uh, so maybe just quickly, Jeff, 30 seconds, if you could give me a, a comment on that part of the Cuss Road questions. It- yeah, it's it, so to the the ta- that tower is uh, essentially on the Cuss Road side, if you will. It's it, that uh, Cuss Road is between uh, Stevens Place and the, and that tower. So uh, Z- Z- Zellner's assumption that uh, that Teresa went left and then turned left on uh, Q, uh, Q uh, to yeah. get to to get to Cuss Road makes makes sense to get to be get going towards that tower at least, but. You're absolutely correct that even even on Cust Road, there are more, uh, you know, closer proximity towers uh, that it's likely that you would, uh, you know, be able to attach to. Uh, you know, all, all that data th- that they should have for the cellular forensics is just is just long gone. Um, yes. With regard to you know the neighbor lists, because you know towers tell you what tower you should try next once you leave the footprint of this one. Uh, you know, if we if we had that data, we could say things. We could say some more definitive things. And if that tower were still there, we could make some more definitive measurements. But but that's gone. So yes. Did you want to say something about that, Mill Billy? I wasn't quite sure whether you were itching to make a comment there. Yeah. Nope. Okay. So there's a question here from uh, Paul Ward in relation. I I I. I raise this question with some degree of sensitivity because we're talking about a real person here but uh, the question here is that um, does anyone think that maybe Teresa's blood is planted in the was planted in the rav as distinct from you know getting there through through her demise um, if, a, if and if her body was found in Cuss Road which is a, a reasonable argument based on what we know um, do, do we regard that her blood was planted inside her rav after that event any thoughts about that from anyone? Mm, I, I tend to think okay. that um, it's genuine because uh, why would they withhold the RAV for, for you know, Kathleen and her team to look at, into that? Um, yeah, I agree with what you're saying about um, that she was possibly killed down there um, and it could have been while she was, uh, you know, behind the back of a car and... But there's so, there's so many questions. Well, I don't know. If, yeah. if I if I could chime in on that one for a second, Mark, if if uh, you know our, yeah. our good friend uh, Ke- Kelly has uh, works with somebody we call Investigator T, who we've played her videos on on, on Bill Billy's channel, and and our good friend Dr. Silkman from the Fall Play channel, both both of them indicate that uh, it's most likely that you'll find a mixture of the killer's blood and the victim's yeah. blood. Uh, and we just don't have that in the, in, you know, in, in the RAV. Uh, there's, there's, there's no mixture of blood uh, that, you know, whatever blood of Stevens in the RAV isn't mixed, whatever's blood of Teresa's is not mixed with anybody else's. So that in and of itself is is suspicious. It may, it may, it may be original, but why is there no mixture? Both of them are, quote, unquote, actively bleeding. Mm. Yes. Well, there was, mild, there was mild blood on the uh, on the back of the, the RAV. Yeah, floor. but 
they never submitted it. They never submitted it for testing. Exactly. That's right. But it was, but it wasn't Stevens. A twenty-three no. ruled out. They knew that he was ruled out. Yeah. So whose was it? And, and yeah. likewise with the the like the eight Leighton prints that were all around the back as well. Stephen was ruled out of those. Mm-hmm. But no and one ran in. in. So, I don't. And no, Brendan. but yes. Which goes back to this burning question about the rab itself and uh, it not being released for testing. Um, and obviously that, that then tends to lead on to the broader question about does it even exist? Um, I'm not into conspiracy theories much myself, but I, I'll throw it out there because people ask it from time to time. Do we believe the rab exists? Um, anyone like to comment on that? There, there uh, are in, sorry. No, please, Diane, go ahead. <laughs> oh no! I was just going to say that they were actually planning um, with Kathleen for her to have access to the Rav Four, and I think it would be really risky for them to start doing that if they actually had no intention. And the only reason why they stopped that was because the, the court filed unexpectedly, apparently. But yes, uh, I do indeed. think that it still exists. Um, but just don't really yeah. want anyone to get hold of it. It's my opinion. Uh, I, I know. I know. There's been a law passed in Wisconsin that says that you know if, if you have things, uh, just because of uh, logistical matters, you know if 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 there's certain blood stains and you only you can cut out the areas and keep those swatches and photos will do the rest. Uh, so it's it's when they say does it exist anymore? It's it's not. It's it's actually a good question. You know, have have they taken those measures that are legal in Wisconsin to only preserve the areas? Of so-called evidence, uh, that I, I think it's a very good question to ask. Uh, you know, what is the state of the Rav right now of, of, the, of that vehicle? Wouldn't they exactly. document that somewhere, though? That if if they did do that, I mean, given the fact that they don't really <laughs> document things correctly, but <laughs> they would have yeah. to look like they're doing something right. Yeah, I mean, if you if you were if you were you know Kathleen Zellner and or a scientist and you had the RAV in uh, available to you for examination, what would be the thing you'd be looking for? I'll go around the go around the screen, Jeff. What would you be looking for? Uh, well, I, I would I would love to. Pe people mentioned A23, and Diane brought up A23, which is that blood stain. Uh, I think unfortunately, the biological experts that I know tell me that that is is long. You know, is is, is long uh, rendered, you know, no longer viable to sample, uh, just because it's been so long. Uh, but 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 I, I'd like to understand the the broken headlight. Uh, we, we I don't understand how come, come we can't get access to that forensically test that. So that that would be uh, the, the most real thing that I think that we get our hands on. What about you, Tracy? What would what would pique your interest? And in, as far as the rail is concerned, the hood latch. The hood latch. Yeah, yes. for sure, for sure. Um, I, you know, where are the prints, please? If somebody's standing there enough to have sweated buckets, um, they haven't just stood over it, you know what I mean? Like they've touched this, like, yeah. Let's look into yes. the latch, please. Okay, Diane, what are your feelings about that? Yeah, I agree with um, Jeff and Tracy. I do wonder though, talking about the, um, the viability of A23 about whether it will be tested whether it could be tested a bit like, um, you know, science is moving forward so fast. I mean, once upon a time, we wouldn't even have been able to test the bones. And now they have the the capabilities of doing that. So you know, it, would be, it would be, uh, you know, really great if something came up that allowed yep. that to happen. I mean, I don't know what the science is behind that. But um, yeah, I think looking at the hood latch for sure, that would be, um, something, you know, maybe uh, Mr. Sweaty himself would, would put crap on you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And uh, Mr. Billy, Mel Billy, I know you're sitting there on Cuss Road at the moment, so uh, what are your thoughts about the, the Rav? The VIN. The VIN. Tell me about what's on your mind about the VIN. I'd like to see a picture from the VIN on every location of the vehicle and see if they all match. Okay. So you have some doubt about whether the car is the car? Is that what you're saying? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Okay. Right. I believe uh, 
parts of her car are in that car. Yep. Okay. Like the rear coping and the rear tailgate cover. Okay, that's interesting. So simple to take out. Why is the carpet untucked on the rear passenger side? That doesn't happen. You can't pull that up. Yeah. You got to be looking for something. Yeah. Yep, the RAV is as safe as the Bodes. That's what I've said before. <laughs> where's Where's the rear carpet pad? <laughs> yep. This case is just like riddled with bad actors, isn't it? Like, you know, I know Netflix, isn't it ever? Netflix can't put this together. You know what I mean? Um, no, you can't make this up, right? Yeah. No. That's the, that's the thing. So. And why why uh, did Dave why did Dave Remaker testify that the VIN moved? How does a VIN that's stamped into the dash move? <laughs> it's been tampered yeah. with. He take, I, I'm surprised he said that at trial. That shocked me, but yeah, he certainly yeah. said it. I said a lot of things at trial, though. I mean, you know, from pre-trial to trial, things changed. At first, he says he couldn't read all the numbers. Then he said he could. Then he said he couldn't. And then he said it moved. Mm -hmm. He said he could only verify all but two of the numbers. It's almost comedic, isn't it? Like, if it wasn't real in real life. Yeah. And any time Jerry or Dean got close to anything that would that I know where they were going, the, the court shut it down. Either the judge stopped in or Kratz or Fallon objected. Yeah, like, like they, the deleted voicemails, for example. And Jerry Beauty messed up when he asked for... Remaker slips up and says he reviewed audio. Jerry Bruni should have asked for all the audio. He asked for just the audio that Remaker had used to prepare for a trial. So um, I'm very mindful of the time and uh, we've run over a little bit because it took a while to introduce all ourselves. Um, I'm extremely grateful for everyone participating today. Um, hopefully we answered most of the questions. I would like to uh, just before we do finish up, mention a couple of things. And But firstly, to ask everyone individually, um, what do they think will be the Court of Appeals decision um, whenever it's released, which can't be, one would think, a whole lot further away. So I'll go to you, Jeff. What do you think they're going to say? I mean, I, I remain hopeful. Uh, there have been, there've been a couple of cases. She has she has a lot of possible things. I, 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 I My hope is that she gets her evidentiary hearing. Okay. Me, I second that. Uh, I, Diane, tell me what you think. Yeah, I agree. I, I, um, I hope that she, she gets to go to court with this and that Stephen has an opportunity. Um, I think that with the, the amount of people all across the world who are viewing this, um, I don't think that they could walk away from it so easily. And I am hopeful that um, something good will come. No uh, matter how Tra long it takes. Tracy, your thoughts? Um, I want the hearing. I want the evidence into court that she has. I want the newly discovered evidence. For I want to see the stuff they won't show us. Yeah. I want to hear the things they won't let us hear. I want to read the reports that they keep hiding. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Me too. I want to, I want to see what um, I want to see what they've got. Um, and you know, obviously for Stephen, of course for Stephen. But also, this has a big impact for Brendan's case as well. Yeah. And going back into state court on a post-conviction petition, oh, for uh, sure. with evidence. So, yeah, yeah. Um, d does any do any of you even rationalise the possible that take the emotion out of it? The possibility that the court of appeal would say this is not worthy mm -hmm. of an evidentiary hearing. I can see them ruling two to one against or in favour against. So what would what would be 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 the uh, justice there, Mill Billy? What would be your if you put yourself in that that perspective? What would be the reason why you you don't think the evidence is worthy of a hearing? Because we do know the law favours the plaintiff, that is Stephen. That is that the presumption that the evidence is worthy is with Stephen. So why do you think they would go against that? They're corrupt. Oh, okay. That says it all, I guess. So. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what about you, Jeff? Do you do, can uh, can you contemplate them going? No, it's not worthy. We're going to dismiss the appeal. Well, in, in a in a fair system, I believe that she has made uh, uh, several grounds. But I, I 
tend to agree with Millbilly if you look at the players. I mean, look, look, look at, um, you know, what, what, one of the judges, not in this trial, but uh, uh, there's a judge now in Wisconsin named Jennifer Nashold, who just happened to be the first person that received the reports from Deb Strauss and Amy Lehman that created the, the Avery report in the first place for, for Peg Lautenschlager. She's now a judge. Right, so th- th- you know, this this is a, this is a highly interconnect, inter- interconnected uh, Wisconsin you know crime family. Uh, Josh Call, the current Wisconsin Attorney General's Peg Blattenschlager's son. Uh, yeah, they're you know it's three uh, of so the four can, judges yeah. that are going to see his case have history with Stephen Avery. Yeah, it's I, I so I can see it. Yes, and and I believe if if it were fair, I believe he gets the the new trial in a snap. Uh, the, uh, the, minimally, the evidentiary hearing in a snap, but I think there's corruption there. Mm. So, Diane, you're feeling about that same matter? Do you feel that corruption still is still a potential player in this decision? Of course, because of how much <laughs> there already the, has been. The, the Brendan. Yeah, they can't, they can't not be, but like, us, like I said before, there are way too many people looking at this. It's easy to do your corrupt business when people are blinded by it but there are so many people who aren't now and know exactly what they're up to i think it would cause way too much of a stir if they didn't do things properly yeah and so i the best disinfectant (laughs) i think i think sadly like i'm very much an optimist as well but um we just have to see in brendan's case how how hard the state went um you know, to, to keep that boy behind bars. So for me, I think, yes, inherently, the, the justice system in Wisconsin is about that finality. It's not necessarily about the seeking of the truth. Look what um, they did to get Stephen. They went after it, it, exactly. look at Look at the first case, you know. Um, we have, what, 23 eyewitnesses and they, they still get a conviction. So uh, I... I remain optimistic, um, but I think we have to be prepared for, for for not getting what we want. And I think they've shown that, despite the fact that there's a you know um, there's a global spotlight on. I'm, on the I'm, table. Just, I'm just glad that Stephen is still remains positive. A hundred percent. Yeah. And he does. Yeah. Well, one of, one of the benefits uh, of this process is. The, the reasons for their decision, particularly if it's a decision to dismiss the appeal, the reasons have to be documented on the record. And therefore you have you have that to go against when you start to analyze the outcome. So you have it on the record. And mm-hmm. each of those justices who are dealing with this matter will, ha- will have their name attached to that. Um, mm-hmm. So that gives you a basis of going forward. Um, my observation, I, I accept what you say about, you know, the corruption still has a a place to play here. Looking at other jurisdictions, I definitely you definitely observe a different level of behaviour at the appeal court level. The justices seem seem generally uh, to be more interested in the law than in the game. But yeah. whether that's true in this case, time will tell. But it's certainly an observation that when I've looked at other just uh, appeal court decisions. They're very focused on what the law says. They kind of separate themselves. But whether that separation is achievable in, in Wisconsin and in this case, uh, who knows? Mm. But hopefully we'll have a decision soon. And Stephen does remain extremely positive. So that's wonderful. Yeah. Hey, I just wanted to mention a couple of things before we go. And um, uh, firstly, I wanted to thank um, um, Twitter Eye of the Tiger, who... Um, who uh, provided this uh, little logo for us, MAM101, in the background. He constructed it. Sorry, I'll try to get out of the way. But uh, So thank you very much to, to him for doing that. And uh, it would be remiss of me also not to um, to comment. Today is uh, Sandra Greenman's uh, birthday. So we want to wish uh, Sandra a very happy birthday today. Happy birthday, happy Sandra. Birthday. Uh, yeah. So, and a, a huge thank you uh, to Stacey Seabrook for allowing us to... Uh, play his music uh, as part of this. Um, he's just prolific when it comes to songwriting and telling stories. He's just a wonderful man. So I see, Mill Billy, you're trying to say something there. So Yeah, I don't think they could hear the audio for the songs. Oh, no? Is that right? Yeah. I, I noticed it. I didn't hear it. I couldn't hear it, yeah. 
<laughs> I think I remember this happening once. Oh yeah, you got to pull your headphones out when you play yeah. something. Oh otherwise, really? Only, yeah, otherwise only you can hear it. All right. Well, I I oh, could I... sing I could sing in lieu of that if you like, uh, <laughs> uh, but I think I, yeah. I, I think the session will go much shorter. Well, I'm glad you told me that. And I'll, I'll, I am going to play a song at the end. And what I, in fact, might do is replay the one you couldn't hear when we get to that um, get to that point. If I can quickly find it again. Um, uh, any final comments from anyone before we sign off and uh, play Stacy's music? Only if I can speak to Stacy for one second. I find your music inspirational. Thank you for doing it, and, and keep on doing it. Thank you. Yeah, it's just wonderful. Yeah, I'm into that. Yeah. Trace, what about you, my dear? Happy Valentine's Day, because it's already Valentine's Day in Australia. So, where's my roses, Mark? There's oh, nothing. I... In the really? I thought I had. I thought I sent some down. Uh, See if I'll I can find them. I'll forgive you. Yeah, this no. No, 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 I definitely did. Hang on, I'll just see if I can find them. They're here somewhere. There we go. So <laughs> You had that ready for someone. <laughs> so, <laughs> so there you go. <laughs> see, oh, you know, ko koalas are lovely critters, so, um, and that one's got a raise just for you, Trace. And uh, thanks. <laughs> so... Thank you, everyone, for all that you do. It's it's extremely inspirational. I feel very, very honoured to be part of a group like this, and uh, I also appreciate all the hard work that all the people are doing. Uh, it is it is quite amazing. Um, the stuff I read and listen to, and I go, oh my God, there are some really dedicated and talented people out there working on this matter, and um, hopefully, will it'll result in the the um, exercise that we're after, and that is to get Brendan and Stephen free. And justice right. delivered to them and to Teresa. So, oh, thanks for having me on, but I gotta go. Okay, mate, you can you can toddle off. I'm going to try to clumsily play uh, a, a uh, Stacy Seabrook song here. So just um, just bear with me while I load it and make sure I unplug my uh, my headphones so you can hear. It. God, trust me to do that seriously. So. Uh, I'll say goodbye to you as I do this uh, because you never know what's going to happen when I'm driving the computer. So probably better to say goodbye now. Let's just um, I'll just hit the share screen. All right. uh, here we go. And uh, you're very welcome, everyone. Um, and uh, enjoy the rest of your weekend. And uh, we'll uh, we'll go by we'll leave by listening to Stacy Seabrook. Thanks, Mark. Thank you. See you.
Uh, and actually, those those lyrics came out real, real um, smooth. You know, they came out. Didn't have to work with them or too much. A little bit of finagling, but not a lot of writing. It was just mainly singing this sort of emotion, and then it came out. I always videotape my when I feel a song coming through, and uh, then I just play it over and over till it's honed down. So. I mean, Alan Avery, he's a character. He's a, I think everybody um, or a large percentage of people would like Alan. If you're a real person and you meet Alan Avery, um, you're going to like him. He's a straight shooter. I remember he It was in the, the, <clears throat> the shop where, we, where I met him. And uh, I went up and... Sh- shook his hand, his hand was greasy, and he um, reached out, and I shook his, his hand, you know, covered in grease, because he's always working, and uh, uh, he looked at me and said, there, now you're baptized. <laughs> the 2019 rally in Wisconsin, so I met Dolores there, but we didn't talk, she was very, it was a cold day in June, <laughs> um, she was wrapped up. And I leaned down and or said a few words to her, but I don't think she she understood who I was or um, knew about me, or, and I wasn't about to impose myself. So I just said, hey, I, you know, Mark Podnot, who visits Ooh. Stephen, is a supporter, a big supporter, not only Stephen, but Brendan and the whole cause, and a lot of support, he's a supporter of supporters. Uh, wonderful man but he played he played a few songs and mama and papa Avery over the phone to Stephen he played a few songs to Stephen over the phone and uh, and he uploaded a video you know of uh, Stephen's reactions okay so what did you think of that Canada just doing his thing um, and somehow this song made its way all the way to Wisconsin through the prison gates and into Stephen's ear that was um, another you know it's makes you think you know I reused a lyric from Don't Get Strange it was the one about the DA, he's a legal stain. Cause the case was a sham, the trial was a scam. The DA, he's a legal stain. I said, Mama, Papa Avery. That came out on the, when I was writing Don't Get Strange, that came out on the fly. I was just sort of improvising, freestyling. And um, I knew as soon as I wrote that lyric, or, or sung it, I needed to write it down because it was good. So I just actually stopped the song right there and I just wrote that down. But um, Then I reused it in Mom and Papa Avery. The Planted series in those lyrics, it's like... Because the bloody was a planet, the car was a planet, Sam William Henry 582. The bones, they were planted, bullet. particular with the lyrics so I don't put by, by who I don't know it's the thing we don't know what have suspicions of how things could have happened but because there was no real investigation the tunnel vision on Stephen was so strong or planned depending on where you know what train of thought you come from um, there was no real investigation done there's 
and so I just wrote, you know, I just wrote, they were, were planted. So sometimes those things I think get lost on people, and, or they might assume I'm uh, talking about someone. Like, I know who planted them, but no, it's like very particular with the lyrics. You know, you don't don't really need to say much about Dolores and Alan. It's kind of, um, it's right there. Everyone knows it and feels it. That's the whole, um, I mean, who can't love Mama and Papa Avery, the people? 